Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. December 15th is the deadline to enroll in health insurance if you're using the marketplaces established by the Affordable Care Act. Now, you might know that act better as Obamacare. So how is President Obama's signature health care plan holding up in the age of Donald Trump? What future does it have when Republicans would like to destroy it and Democrats increasingly want a single-payer system? And how does Medicaid expansion in Missouri fit into all of this? Well, joining me in studio to talk about this issue is Timothy McBride. Tim is a professor at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. He's also co-director of the Center for Health Economics and Policy Institute for Public Health. Tim, welcome to the program. Uh, Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, for those of you listening, uh, we're wondering, do you support Medicaid expansion in Missouri? You can give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. So, Tim, what's the status of the Affordable Care Act marketplace? Are plans more or less affordable this year than in the past? It's interesting. The news is actually relatively good this year in the affordable care marketplaces. Um, the premiums are down slightly, about 3% um, in, in Missouri and nationwide. It's about the same. That might surprise people a little bit. The last but there's tr- actually some good news. Yeah, there's actually some good news. Um, and it, it's complicated, um, as it always is with in health insurance. And so everybody needs to go up to healthcare.gov and put in their individual information to find out what the situation is for themselves because um, what they can actually get for themselves can vary a lot based on their age and their health, household situation and stuff. Are so, there a number of different plans that are yeah, options this year? And that's also good news too. Uh, across Missouri, there's actually a few new insurers that are offering plans. So there's more choices and the premiums are down a little bit. Um, which hasn't been the case in the past. As you mentioned, it's been kind of somewhat bad news in the past uh, two or three years ago. The news was uh, a little bit of a struggle. So, what do you think is driving this good news in Missouri? Well, um, you know, I think people were kind of looking at the Affordable Care Act and the marketplaces, which is actually a small piece of the overall insurance markets. And insurers, which these are all private plans, they were a little bit unsure about whether this was going to last. There were so many court hearings yeah, trying to stop it. There's been, you know, 50 or 60 times the Congress has tried to kill it and was unable to do it. There were several um, lawsuits against it, and all that has failed. And so now I think insurers are a little bit uh, more willing to take a risk. Mm-hmm. And, and the the enrollment has been pretty stable, about $8 million in the marketplaces nationwide. And so I think insurers, one of them, the biggest one is in St. Louis, actually Centene um, has the biggest marketplace plan in the whole country. And so they're they're kind of figuring out that there's a niche for this marketplace. Um, and so that it's fairly stable and they're staying in this um, in the long run. So that is some good news. Mm-hmm. Uh, for people who are looking at their various options, how do things differ for rural residents of this state versus urban ones? That's a fabulous question. And I've studied that a lot over the last four or five years. You know, frankly, it's almost a tale of two regions of the United States. Frankly, I think people in urban areas like in St. Louis here, in, you know, in Chicago, New York, the it's generally better uh, options, more options, and lower premiums than in rural areas. But the the sort of the story that we tell in a lot of the research we've written in about a thousand counties in the United States about um, the it's there's a struggle, frankly, to get decent prices for rural areas. And why is that? The main reason is you know insurance works. Um, you need people, basically. You know, it's a risk pooling issue. Um, the more people you have, the more you can spread the risk, you can spread the costs. Um, and insurers are reluctant to go where there are few people. And, you know, it's hard to go sell insurance in the middle of Nebraska where there are, frankly, f- fewer people than cows. So if and there's one person there who's sick, that could really impact their bottom line. That's basically the math. Okay. And so if you got one person with cancer out in the middle of uh, Nebraska, insurers are going to go, oh, we got to raise the premium. So the premiums are pretty high if you look in northeast Missouri, and they're a lot higher than they are in St. Louis. 
Well, that's unfortunate. It is really unfortunate. Overall, in terms of the number of people using these marketplaces, um, is that something that is higher in years past? Or? No, it's pretty, well, it's actually a little lower in Missouri. We're now at about 220,000. We don't know what the numbers are going to be for 20. Uh, 20 yet because for this current deadline yeah, um, but in the last few years it's down a little bit um, and you know the, we peaked about three years ago and what would you attribute that to the fact that it's down is that just we've got a good economy we think that uh, that's one factor probably because you know they were at historically low unemployment rates so more people are getting employer insurance um, we also think you know the premiums are relatively high in the marketplaces and uh, two or three years ago they went up um, also, the Trump administration, when they came in, they cut back on what are called the navigators. Um, so they basically disappeared. The people that can help you sign up. Oh, okay. So, Somebody to be a liaison yeah, to help explain you know, this program. Health insurance is difficult to navigate. So they created these people that would help you figure out how to do this. So they're basically gone now, and you have to basically navigate this for yourself. And they're so... Um, if you're continuing in the program, you're fine, but you know, a new person... They're not out there. They might be a little timid. Yeah, and there's no marketing for this really anymore. So in the in the timeline, you know, the open enrollment period is a lot shorter than it used to be. So, so as an expert in these sort of things, um, I know it's hard to reduce it just to a, a short answer. But what would people need to know in order to enroll in one of these? What's some advice you would give to somebody thinking about whether or not to, to take the plunge? I would say don't be discouraged, especially if your um, income is uh, somewhat low by that I mean two or three times the poverty line say thirty or forty thousand um, dollars and if your if your income is if your age is say thirty or forty years old um, you know you can actually qualify for some really significant subsidies hmm. these plans are actually quite low you might even be qualified for a plan that's almost zero or twenty or thirty dollars per month Really? Um, yeah, because there's still very significant uh, subsidies. Um, but also be a very smart consumer because in the early years, people went and bought plans that had very high deductibles. So they were really kind of drawn by the light of having a really low premium, but they didn't realize that it had like an $8,000 uh, deductible. That's a huge deductible. And then, they, you know, they break their leg and they go, oh, my God, I got this big bill. So look very carefully at the the plan details. Um, unfortunately, if your income's a little higher, if you're, you know, say sixty, seventy thousand dollars, if you're a consultant or something, and you don't have insurance, your premium might be pretty high. Um, so again, be a careful consumer. What about for people who are searching for plans outside those government marketplaces? Any advice for them? Sometimes you know, people are just in a, a weird situation right there. I mean, uh, frankly, I, our advice is to look in the marketplace because you qualify for the subsidies. Um, you might qualify and not realize it. Yeah. And, you know, I think I, we've been perplexed why people don't look in the marketplaces and they still go outside the marketplaces. I think, you know, it's a, a struggle for figuring that out. I think it's because they don't like Obamacare. They don't – they have a relationship with an, a, a broker or something. But I would look at the marketplace first and see because you may be throwing away – Two or three hundred dollars a month in subsidies. Wow, that's a lot so, of money. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we're talking to Tim McBride of Washington University about the various um, points of the healthcare marketplace here in Missouri as well as in Illinois. And another part of this, under Obamacare, states have the option to expand Medicaid to people earning up to 138% of the federal poverty level. There's a group now trying to get this issue onto state ballots. They're aiming for the November 2020 election, which would be obviously the presidential election. Yep. A lot of voters turning out for that. Last week, Governor Mike Parson said he would go along with expansion if that's what the public wants. So, Tim McBride, if this goes through, what would it mean for Missouri? Well, it's a, it would be a really big deal. And, you know, the, the uh, just to be clear, we're not part of this effort, and I'm not part of this effort. This is an advocacy effort that's going forward. Um, but I think the thought that's uh, uh, going on here is there are about 37 states that have expanded Medicaid. It became optional because of the Supreme Court decision, and Missouri's been very reluctant to do it. The legislature has absolutely refused to do it. Conservatives really yes. don't like this yeah. option. Yeah, and, and you know they have valid reasons in their own minds for not doing that. So, but advocates looked recently at some three or four states that went a different route, and they went the petition route, the referendum route, and putting it on the ballot. And so advocates in this state went and looked, and they said they noticed something interesting about Missouri is that we pass fairly progressive referendums like on marijuana and um, 
minimum wage and and clean Missouri, but yet we still put in conservatives into all the state positions. So they said maybe Missouri would go for this, especially in a presidential year when there's more progressives turning out. So they're going to take a shot at this. And, you know, they've already gotten to, you know, about, as I understand, about 30 percent of the vote, um, signatures. They're making some headway. Yeah, they make. And so um, and what the governor said is he wouldn't block it, which was interesting, because in some of the states that have actually gotten this pushed through, the governor and the legislature have tried to knock it down. Try to override the will so, of the voters. So, you know, I thought that was an interesting signal from Governor Parson because he, he is sort of suggesting that he's going to be a little bit more moderate on this position. I wonder if um, he's seen some polling and this is yeah, something people you know, want. Yeah, uh, from what I've heard about him, I think he's a reasonable person and he's a very sort of, he's been in the legislature for a long time and he's probably hearing from a lot of different voices, including the Hospital Association, the healthcare industry that know that this is... They would really like this. Yeah, they'd like this as, you know, bring in about $1.5 to $2 billion into the state. Um, and, you know, they've been wanting this for a while. Uh, the insurance industry would like it. Um, and, you know, his conservative side is probably telling him not to do it. So he's being pulled in different directions. So if he gets a vote of the people, that could give him the political cover to, ex- to acquiesce exactly. to that. So. Now, he has also said that Missouri needs to slow the growth of current Medicaid costs before discussing, discussing expansion. What would it take to do that? Well, you know, there's, he, there's a report that's on the website. I used to be the chair of the Medicaid Oversight Committee until last summer. And there's a report on the website that um, uh, documents this, you know, the growth of Medicaid they worry about this quite a bit because it's taking up a large share of the state's budget. Um, but, uh, you know, frankly, the growth of Medicaid is no faster than the growth of any other share of um, uh, health spending. In fact, it's in just the, up, up, up everywhere. Yeah, health spending grows in everywhere Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance. Um, and in fact, the reason the Medicaid share is growing is part of the spending is because the, our taxes are not growing. Mm-hmm. So um, so it is an issue. But um, And, you know, the, the report that the administration sought is actually a thoughtful report. It's called the Medicaid Transformation Report. There's a lot of really good things in it. Uh, frankly, I've read the thing twice. Uh, it's 115 pages, single-spaced. And, you know, there's a lot of things. Our, our Medicaid program needs a lot of changes, to be so honest. There's so there's some good reforms oh, that yeah, it's absolutely. suggesting. Are actually, they reforms we could do now? Uh, frankly, there are a lot of things in there that I think we could do. Hmm. Um, Give me an example. Know. Well, you know, the best the things that are a no-brainer, frankly, that we advocated for when I was on the committee is we have a – this will surprise people when they hear it. We have a 40-year-old computer system <laughs> that runs our Medicaid – uh, program. I bet that's uh, just super efficient. Oh, my God. It's unbelievable. You know, so for those of you who are out there who know computers, our our Medicaid system is built on a COBOL system. Still be people who go, what's COBOL? So, and it is like putting together with Band-Aids right now. Um, okay. And it's so inefficient and so terrible that we advocated for a long time to put money in to fix the computer system. It is so bad right now that you cannot fix and put in some efficiencies to save money and to put in like payment reforms. And we advocated for that while I was on the committee and we actually got the conservatives and the libertarians to say, oh yes, we agree that $100 million needs to be put in additional money to fix this computer system. So we may need a really big upfront expense, but this could save money over time. Oh, absolutely, because it would allow us to put in some efficiencies and incentives. And and actually, the legislature has already put a down payment on that. Okay, so we're actually seeing some movement on this. And I, you know, so that's something that's bipartisan left to right um, that I think could be done, and there's a whole chapter on that. Tim, this is the rare hopeful conversation on healthcare (laughs) I've ever had. You have several points here where I'm like, this is actually good news. Well, you know, there's more I can tell you about that, too. So there's contentious stuff, too. I'm just... Well, and okay, so you led right into this. Speaking of contentious stuff, you have been outspoken about your concerns that Missouri had wrongly kicked a bunch of families off Medicaid Mm -hmm. rolls. Um, The number of children being covered saw a 15 percent drop. Um, And after you raised concerns about this, you were actually removed from the oversight committee. They said your term was just up, but it was very interesting timing. Um, Tell us, what were the concerns you had about this drop in the rolls? Well, you know, 100,000 children were dropped from the Medicaid rolls uh, over a period of about a year and a half. Um, 
and it's now stopped. So, um, and when you say it's stopped, what do you mean? They're, we're not so seeing the ongoing decline. We're not decline? seeing a drop anymore in the Medicaid um, rolls. I'm still following it, even though I'm not on the committee. Um, and you know, that's it's the biggest drop in Medicaid children enrollment in the country by far. So this was and, a huge thing. Yeah, but it's, now it stopped. Do you think it's just because people were speaking out? They realized no, they couldn't just kick people um, off. You know, they told us early on when I was in the committee that they were doing what they were. You know, it was called recertification. They were going into the roles and they were looking. You know, again, I told you the computer system was very old. Mm -hmm. And so I think what literally happened was, you know, the Medicaid costs are pretty high. And they said, you know, what could we do? Well, let's look to see whether people belong in the program or not. And let's look and just sort of send a look at everybody in the roles. There's 600,000 kids and, you know, 900,000 overall. And uh, we'll send a letter to people and say, are you still qualified for the program? That's where everything kind of went haywire because a lot of people, they had the wrong address, so they never got the letter. Some people, and even people who get letters, I'm sure, they, they didn't don't respond always. to it. Some yeah. people actually thought it was letters saying you're still in the program. They threw it away. Mm -hmm. uh, some people didn't have uh, – English was not their first language. And so they admitted to us early on that this was going haywire. Um, and then when I started complaining about it, other people started complaining about it. They were like saying, oh, no, it's the economy. It's other things. Um, and then, you know, I wouldn't give up. Um, and, you know, and, uh, you know, so I think they, they think that a lot of this is appropriate drops in the enrollment. Uh, I disagree. You um, continue to disagree. Yeah, I still continue to disagree. And, you know, I think it's an open question. Um, I think, obviously, the answer is probably somewhere in between. Probably some of these um, people needed to be dropped, I would mm -hmm. assume. Maybe the parents, but the kids, I have a hard time understanding. Kids are eligible up to 300% of the poverty line. So I have a hard time understanding how... The economy is that good that they're but there'd be all such sudden, a steep decline. Yeah, and um, people around the country don't believe it either. So, so what would you like to see happen now? I realize you're not in control of this issue, yeah. but you had called for some action. They didn't do some of the things you wanted. Is there still something that should be done here? Um, I think you know the the legislature called for an investigation of this and to look into. I mean, one I couldn't do it, mm -hmm. but the the Medicaid agency could actually look at these cases. They have the ability to actually look at the individuals and see what happened to them. And like, is that investigation going to happen? Not at this point. No, I. Um, the minority asked for that investigation, and the and the majority party said, "No, we don't. We buy their explanation that this was all appropriate." Okay. So, so the Democrats tried, but yeah. at this point, no investigation. Nope. Mm -mm. So if people are hearing this and they would like to to raise hell, any suggestions of what they could do? Uh, talk to your legislature. Okay. So, um, uh, and, you know, I think the other thing we're doing, and we, we are doing it as well, is trying to track whether this is mattering. You know, I think mm -hmm. one proof of this will be, you know, if we, if this is true that, you know, these women and kids that were dropped, it's mostly women and kids, 127,000, um, and they left the state or they were phantoms, or um, then it's not going to matter. Mm -hmm. They're not going to show up at BJC. They're not going to show up at um, Children's Hospital. But if they uh, were dropped and now they're uninsured, they're going to show up as uninsured patients. So if we and start getting an influx of people who thought they were covered exactly. and realize they're not, that yeah. would prove that you were onto something were, That would prove they were onto something. Or if the state is right and they all of a sudden be, switch from Medicaid to employer insurance, they will show up that way. So the proof will be in that. In the so, numbers so the time and, could, in time, we may yeah, know we'll, this and mystery And we're starting to look solved. at these numbers, actually. Okay. So, and, um, I, you know, so, so stay tuned. I'll be able to tell you that later. So. Well, Tim McBride of the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, thank you for joining us today. Okay, great. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. That's 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.